Uh, our respected speaker, uh, Dr. Rupasana Ray, our senior faculty members, my colleagues, respected participants from INEAS, and invited guests. It's my privilege to have been asked to welcome you on this occasion. In this webinar, which is the second in the series on COVID-19 and its different dimensions, we will have a talk on the topic of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, where did we start and where are we heading, delivered by our eminent speaker, Dr. Rupasana Roy, Senior Scientist and Assistant Professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Immunology, CSR, Indian Institute of Chemical Biology at Kolkata, West Bengal. This webinar series is being conducted jointly by CSCD Immunity Allahabad and Dinias, whose first, whose first webinar has seen success on 7th November 2020. Respected coordinators of this webinar series are Dr. Mpakkanj Kobar, Scientist F, IUSC Delhi and Coordinator, NCR Chapter I, Ineas and Dr. Pragya Divedi, Assistant Professor in CSCT, MNIT, Allahabad, Prayagraj. And Dr. Dinesh Kumar and myself, Dr. Moik Sharkar, are members of this committee. Now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Upasana Rai is a virologist working at CSI Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, IICB, Kolkata. Her laboratory focuses on understanding the host virus interactions and vaccine engineering. Dr. Ray has made significant contribution towards engineering virus like particle-based vaccine candidate against progressive multifocal leukose encephalopathy, a virus-induced neurodegenerative brain disease as a major part of her research at National Institutes of Health. The patent linked with this vaccine has now been licensed to a company for further development. Currently, Dr. Ray works primarily on dengue virus and SARS-CoV-2 to understand how the viral proteins mediate host cell dysfunction and to develop strategies for therapeutic intervention. For her work on hepatitis C virus done at Indian Institute of Science, IAC Bangalore, she was awarded in some medal for young scientists in the year 2015. She has also been awarded with Federal Technology Transfer Award and Fellows Award for Research Excellence Fair by NIH for a work on PML vaccine. She is a recipient of the prestigious SARP Women Excellence Award for the year 2019. Dr. Ray is a member of Indian National Young Academy of Science, INEAS, and, and has also been elected as a member of the Royal Society of Biology. Now, I would like to request uh, Dr. Prasanna Ma'am to start her uh, presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. I'm going to share my slide now. So just let me know if uh, this is now visible to all of you. It might take a uh, few seconds for the internet. Visible, uh, my first. Uh, not, not yet to pass. No. no. Well, by the time it comes up, let me mention uh, that uh, this uh, webinar, the topic which is going to be covered by Dr. Pasna is very, very timely. You know, the whole world is talking about vaccine and once vaccine comes, how we will be you know, di distributing it. And uh, even yesterday, our Honorable Prime Minister chaired a, a meeting of a committee who is looking after uh, the distribution distribution strategy. Upasana, I think you have to select. Uh, you have selected the whole screen. You have to select the PPT. Yeah, so that screen is visible right now. That's what I was asking. Yeah, the screen um, is visible. Yes. Now I think uh, it should be on. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it's oh. on my 
Desktop. Uh, we don't see it yet. Now it is there. Just make it full screen. That's it. Okay. All right. Sorry about okay. it. So yeah. I think it's now on. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. And uh, so thank you so much for inviting me. And it's my pleasure to talk about SARS-CoV-2 vaccine because vaccine engineering is one of my uh, favorite uh, areas. I have been taking interest for last many years. And this is uh, the pandemic, and as uh, you rightly mentioned, it's a very timely uh, topic that uh, you asked me to uh, uh, present on. Uh, so uh, today what I'm going to do is, uh, as there are mixed audiences, or uh, there will be more students who will be with, uh, um, looking at it also in uh, later. So I will be uh, discussing uh, about uh, the pandemic as such, in general, about uh, the vaccine, uh, what is a vaccine, what are the different types of vaccines, and how they are uh, uh, engineered. And then I will go into what's happening in uh, the area of COVID-19. Okay, so uh, as we all know uh, that uh, last year, uh, in the year 2019, uh, Near about this time, uh, there was an out outbreak of a virus, and we all know now it's SARS-CoV-2, or we also call, uh, call it as COVID-19. Uh, it occurred in uh, the city of Wuhan in China, uh, and uh, slowly it took over and uh, spread worldwide. So it was uh, in January uh, uh, 2020, this year, early uh, this year, that uh, first WHO declared uh, this particular viral infection as the public health emergency of international concern. So at this point of time, it was not only in China, uh, it had spread uh, worldwide. And then uh, very soon in March, it was declared as a pandemic. Okay, so today we all know that uh, there are millions who have succumbed to it and uh, many people lost their lives and uh, still it's on. So uh, what is this disease and uh, what is the course of this disease? So it is a viral infection uh, and uh, like any other viral infection, uh, uh, it has um, uh, around uh, two weeks, uh, in general, two weeks course, but then uh, it also spills over more than two weeks uh, many times, which is uh, the severity of this disease and it leads to many severe health conditions. Okay, so in general, uh, um, when it's uh, mildly symptomatic, uh, the disease lasts for two weeks. And uh, after two weeks, generally people recover. Uh, the symptoms might vary from uh, mild to uh, mildly severe to more severe. But then at times, uh, the person suffers more, the patient suffers more, and it spills over more than two weeks. It might go on up to six weeks time before the uh, uh, patient recovers. At times, it, they they don't even recover, and uh, we have seen a lot of deaths. So, uh, so if you now see what all organs uh, this particular virus um, affects, or the uh, pathogenesis of uh, COVID nineteen, it's very uh, widespread. It's a multi organ uh, disease. If you take it. Uh, uh, all together, although the main uh, organs it uh, affects is the lung uh, and to some extent uh, the heart and also brain. Okay. The brain part was discovered later, um, a few months back. 
So majorly it's lung, but uh, it's not only uh, that is affecting uh, a person during uh, the course of the disease, but then even after the recovery, uh, the uh, pathogenic effects of this virus uh, retains, and that's where the problem is. So we have seen uh, some reports where 30% uh, uh, lung damage has been there, even if a person uh, suffered only uh, mildly symptomatic uh, uh, um, pathogenic condition. Okay, so, uh, and a 30% lung damage is a huge damage for uh, a person's lung. So that reflects how serious uh, the condition can be for a person. So uh, due to all this, there has been a, a long um, uh, uh, and a very sustained effort, uh, efforts from uh, different groups uh, throughout the world uh, regarding uh, how to overcome COVID-19. So uh, people have um, uh, looked into new drug targets. So there have been two major arms on protection, prophylaxis, and uh, uh, you know, uh, treatment. So the treatment arm includes uh, long, uh, drug targets and uh, drug candidates, uh, drug discovery, and the other arm that is a vaccine that we'll be talking about today in more detail uh, has also been taken up very seriously. And there are, it's surprising and it's very impressive to see how so many different groups have come together and it has been so uh, quickly done that so many vaccine candidates and so many drug candidates have been worked on and there are so many clinical trials going on currently. So now, uh, if you see vaccine, uh, for people who are not from this area, I would like to uh, emphasize, and people who already are from biology field and uh, immunologists, they already know a vaccine, what a vaccine is. But essentially, vaccine is a biological preparation that is which arises uh, from, from uh, the pathogen itself. It can be a protein, it can be RNA, DNA, whatsoever. And what it does is to provide uh, a person uh, immunity. So what is this immunity? So that involves recognition of the pathogen uh, now and also um, preparing the body to recognize the pathogen uh, in future. So there are three major functions of a vaccine to recognize uh, uh, a pathogen as a foreign, uh, to destroy it, so if I'm infected now, the uh, vaccine should be able uh, to destroy it or my immune system should be taught in a way uh, that uh, it can destroy it for now. And also my immune system should be able to remember this pathogen as foreign so that in future insult, um, the body can uh, overcome uh, the uh, you know, infection. Okay, so. A vaccine provides protective immunity and immunological memory, which is very important. So there are two uh, major components, uh, two major cell cellular components of uh, our immune system uh, that are triggered um, by a vaccine, the T cells and the B cells. And there are many other cells, which I won't go into uh, uh, in this presentation, but essentially T cells and the B cells should be activated and should be primed when I'm using a vaccine. And uh, my vaccine should, uh, the vaccine uh, that we use should be able to educate uh, my uh, T cells and the B cells to uh, recognize, destroy, and uh, remember uh, the pathogen as a pathogen. Okay. So now, uh, so there are different ways vaccines can be engineered. And uh, none of these can be uh, called as less or more efficient. It all depends upon uh, uh, a particular disease or uh, the type of candidate that has been developed and how it has been developed. So essentially there are two different types of vaccines, uh, the whole organism vaccines and the subunit vaccines. Um, so the whole organism vaccines uh, are uh, derived uh, from uh, the entire pathogen. Here I'll be uh, talking in terms of the virus. So if you take the entire virus, so that is um, the source of the vaccine. Uh, but here the trick is you cannot use uh, the um, infectious 
virus as a vaccine candidate because it's going to cause the disease, right? So what you do is to either make it incompetent so it cannot replicate well in its host or you inactivate uh, the pathogen and then used. But in totality, it has the entire uh, structure. It has the genetic component into it, although inactive or um, uh, uh, reduced activity. So how you do, so there are, uh, thus it can be divided into two subcategories, live attenuated vaccine or inactivated vaccine. And I'm sure you might have come across these terminologies. Now, um, uh, during this pandemic, we, talk, we have been talking about different types of vaccines that have been, uh, 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 you know, talked about in different newspapers, like uh, the uh, more commonly talked about are the Oxford vaccine or the Bharat Biotech vaccine, say. So they are different categories, right? They are, again, they come from the whole organism, but either they are live attenuated or they're inactivated, um, uh, either of them. So how you make a li live attenuated vaccine? So for that, you uh, force the virus to grow uh, or get adapted to another host system. So if I am, so if I talk in terms of COVID-19 virus or SARS-CoV-2, so I would uh, make SARS-CoV-2 um, stay or adapt to another host system, uh, which is a non-human host system. And now it takes some time uh, to adapt to the new system, how by incorporating certain mutations in its genome. So now at certain point of time, this virus that is growing in another host system cannot uh, multiply or replicate very well as it used to be in its original host that is the human. So now uh, uh, I use uh, this modified version of the virus as a vaccine candidate. So that's my live attenuated vaccine. The second type is inactivated vaccine where I take the virus and I inactivate it using different chemicals or radiations. So um, the virus now cannot infect. Okay, so in the first category, live attenuated, it cannot uh, replicate well. The second category uh, that is the inactivated vaccine, it cannot infect. Okay, so, uh, so these uh, are the whole organism vaccines. Then you have the subunit vaccines. Subunit vaccines, as the terminology itself uh, reflects, it uh, comes from different parts of the pathogen or the virus. So it can be different proteins of the virus taken, uh, isolated proteins of the virus, or the DNA or the genome or RNA of the virus. Okay, the other category that uh, has been uh, called as subunit vaccines, but it also uh, at times uh, uh, it, it is kept as completely separate category that is the virus-like particles. And I will explain that also a bit because it has been one of the major um, vaccine categories that have been worked out for COVID-19. Okay, now, so how does uh, the vaccine work? So again, um, uh, we all know, uh, especially the biologists, uh, we have uh, read in our masters um, how a vaccine works. There are two different uh, pathways of the immune system endogenous pathway and the exogenous pathway. So where essentially there are two different uh, major histocompatibility complex molecules or MHC molecules, which are present on the cell surfaces that play a role in presenting uh, the antigens, the viral antigens uh, on the cellular surface, which is then recognized by the immune effector cells, that is the T cells, which then educate the B cells to produce antibodies. Okay, so um, what happens, uh, uh, most of our cells have uh, these MHC class one molecules. There are two different classes of MHC, class one and class two. Class one are present on, uh, it's a generic molecule and uh, it's present on most of the cell types. Class two molecules are present on antigen presenting cells, uh, uh, like the dendritic cells. Uh, so uh, you can see here, so what happens in uh, the uh, in case of uh, the endogenous pathway is that uh, the antigen or uh, say a viral protein, I'm just exemplifying to make it easy. It's not so easy though. Um, the protein is uh, processed inside uh, the cell in, uh, by uh, structures called as proteasomes. 
So these uh, proteasomes would cleave uh, the uh, protein, viral protein here, into uh, short fragments or the peptides. And these peptides are um, in turn presented uh, by this MHC class one molecules that my cursor is encircling over here. Uh, so the red uh, part here is the peptide. So this MHC presented peptide is further uh, recognized by receptors of uh, CD8 positive T cells, one of the types of T cells. And then these T cells would produce cytokines. Uh, so these are the chemical mediators and uh, the T cells would proliferate and lyse the infected viral infected cells. The another half, uh, the exogenous pathway, uh, how it functions, uh, it would function uh, via the antigen presenting cells. So please uh, don't look at the DNA vaccine part over here. So it's just an example, just uh, ignore this part. But in case of exogenous pathway, uh, an antigen where the DNA vaccine here is, an, uh, is just an example of one of the antigens. It can also be protein. Uh, one of the viral proteins, say, which we are using as a vaccine candidate is taken up by the antigen presenting cells. And then these, uh, uh, these uh, antigens are uh, presented by MHC class two molecules, which are typical, uh, typically present only on uh, antigen presenting cells. And these uh, antigens presented by MHC class two molecules are further recognized by CD4 positive T cells. Okay, so I talked about CD8 positive T cells here. Is another class CD8 positive, CD4 positive T cells. CD4 positive T cells would recognize MHC class two presented uh, uh, antigens and then in turn produce again cytokines. There are different kinds of cytokines, but here uh, the cytokines that are produced by CD8 four positive T cells would also uh, activate CD8 positive T cells on one hand and on other hand, it would uh, activate the B cells. Okay, so we all have heard of B cells by now and B cells uh, are the ones which then differentiate into, uh, it's not shown here, but it it's differentiates into memory B cells and the plasma cells. Plasma cells are the category of B cells which are responsible for producing antibodies. So these antibodies would in turn recognize the pathogen or the pathogen infected cells and help in the uh, you know, elimination process. So this is how in general uh, the immune system works um, when we use a vaccine. Now, in case of COVID-19, it looks very complicated, but why I have put this slide is to tell you that uh, essentially these are the different classes of the immune system that are triggered by the um, uh, kind of uh, vaccine candidates that we have uh, been trying or different groups have been trying. So it can be say a DNA vaccine, it can be an RNA vaccine, it can be viral vectors or VLPs or even subunit vaccines. Ultimately, they all lead to uh, uh, you know, um, triggering the antigen presenting cells uh, and been um, uh, processed by antigen presenting cells and um, displayed by MHC class one and class two molecules uh, to the CD8 positive uh, and CD4 positive T cells. So the T ultimately T cells and T cells would then uh, produce memory T cells and B cells would get activated. Memory B cells will be produced and antibodies will be produced. Okay. Now, uh, uh, as you remember, a uh, couple of slides back. Uh, designing uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine candidates by many groups. And I have a Hello, Pashna. Your voice is breaking up. Sorry. <laughs> Is it okay? 
Yeah, it's better now. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, all right. So, VLPs uh, are basically based on the types of viruses itself, and uh, viruses themselves are of two different types: the non-enveloped viruses and the enveloped viruses. In case, so, uh, in any virus, there is a genetic material, right? And that genetic material is encased inside a proteinaceous shell known as a capsid. So, either this capsid can be naked. In that case, we call those viruses as non-enveloped viruses, or uh, such capsids can in turn be encased inside another shell, uh, and this time it's a lipid shell which has the viral proteins embedded uh, in this lipid bilayer, and this lipid bilayer is obtained from the host cell itself. So this particular group of viruses uh, where the capsid is encased inside a lipid layer is called as enveloped viruses. Now, based upon these different types of viruses, VLPs can be generated where the genetic material is not there. However, it retains the, um, uh, either the capsid alone or uh, the capsid uh, with the envelope or the envelope itself. So the beauty of this platform lies in uh, the uh, type of antigenic display that this particular platform has. So here, as you see, that it's almost like uh, it's akin to the virus, like devoid of the genetic material, but it's, it is more or less like the virus itself. And here, mm, uh, the viral antigens are displayed in a very high density, repetitive manner. Okay. So please remember this very high density, repetitive manner. And this particular type of display is extremely important for eliciting a uh, high uh, titer neutralizing antibody response. So we have seen earlier, um, biologists have seen earlier that, uh, you know, you don't produce antibodies against your own uh, proteins, right? Our, our body doesn't produce antibody against our own proteins. And if I do so, I will develop autoimmune disease, correct? So now if I take my uh, uh, self protein and I display it on a matrix, say, uh, in a high density repetitive manner. Now people have seen that this particular display would be able to elicit uh, antibody uh, uh, immune response, even if uh, the antigens are self antigens. So that's why high density repetitive uh, display of antigens are extremely important for eliciting a uh, good uh, potent immune response. Okay, and the second part, second reason why it's uh, again um, important is that it's non-replicating. Hence, it's safe. So I'll just give uh, an example how uh, we developed uh, this vaccine, which was against uh, uh, a virus uh, called as JC polyoma virus, which, which causes a neurodegenerative brain disease. I won't go into the disease and this virus, but this is just to tell you how VLPs are generated. Okay. Uh, and a similar um, a technique or mechanism that has also been used for uh, developing VLPs against COVID-19 virus. So in our case, uh, our virus was uh, JCV or JC polyoma virus. And this virus uh, is a non-enveloped virus. It doesn't have an envelope on top of it. So this is the capsid. Uh, so circular, if you see, there are circular structures over here and I have encircled one uh, in red. So that is called as a capsomer. It's a single unit uh, of the capsid. So there are 72 of these uh, capsomers which form uh, the entire capsid. And each of these capsomer in turn is uh, formed of uh, five different, uh, five uh, VP1 proteins. Uh, these are the major capsid proteins. So that's the monomer. So five VP1 would form uh, a capsomer. So it's a pentameric structure and these the 72 of these pentamers will now form the entire capsid. So it's the VP1, which is the major capsid protein for this particular virus. And there are other minor capsid proteins which are more important for uh, infectious, uh, for the infection process or the entry process to happen. Okay, so uh, we have seen over years that viruses, many viruses are able to self-assemble. 
inside the host cell. What does that mean? So if you have the viral capsid proteins or the viral structural proteins, um, uh, uh, you know, in a physiological state, these proteins can assemble themselves into uh, virus-like structures. So that is the technology uh, that is used in um, uh, designing uh, virus-like particles. So here, uh, what you do essentially is um, say, if I want to produce my virus uh, VLP candidate in a mammalian uh, cell line, because then the post-translational modifications will be like mammalian cells. So I want, I, what I would do is to clone we all know what cloning is. So we'll clone our uh, viral structural proteins in a mammalian expression plasmid. Here is VP1, okay? And uh, then if you want to have a reporter, you can have a reporter as a separate plasmid. So that reporter is more important in case you want to develop a, a readable system, which is called a pseudovirus system. Okay, I will tell what that is. So for making the vaccine you only need this part so you transmit this or introduce this in uh, in cell line mammalian cell line and now this would uh, produce so it's a dna dna will produce rna rna will pr produce protein so vp1 or the structural proteins will uh, get uh, produced inside the host cell and then they self assemble there are different processes elaborate processes for uh, uh, you know isolating uh, these VLPs out of uh, the cell lysate. So uh, the end result, what you get is virus-like particle, which is uh, which can be used as uh, for the immunization purpose. Okay, now I have written pseudovirus. So we hear about uh, neutralization assay system. What is neutralization assay system? So when I talk about a vaccine, and I'm using a vaccine, uh, uh, I'm uh, testing my vaccine in say mouse model or uh, in lower animals to check uh, the immunogenicity of uh, my candidate. I, I have to check the neutralizing uh, antibody titer also. How do I do that? I need an assay system. That assay system is called a neutralization assay system where uh, I have the virus and I have uh, I have either uh, the infectious virus or I create a virus uh, like particle but with a, uh, a reporter uh, system in it so that I can read uh, the viral infection without getting infected myself. So that's a pseudovirus. So it, it is devoid of the uh, viral genetic material, but instead it contains a DNA or a plasmid which expresses uh, luciferase or any other reporter protein, a reporter gene. Okay, so uh, the size of the DNA here, which gets encapsulated inside the pseudovirus is important. It should not be bigger than what the virus generally encapsulates inside. In our case, it was five kilo uh, KB. So, and our uh, plasmid was a uh, little less than five, five KB and uh, the virus could encapsulate it inside. So now when I have uh, antibody in, a, in my assay system, uh, this virus, which would uh, ideally uh, transduce or enter the host cell, cannot uh, enter the host cell now because there is uh, antibody uh, and it, the antibodies will bind to the pseudovirus and will stop the pseudovirus to enter the cells. So uh, we won't see the luciferase or the reporter gene expression and that is the readout of the infection and that's how neutralization assay system works. So we have the assay system and we have the uh, VLP vaccine. Uh, and in our case, uh, we also did a human trial and uh, it could generate high titan neutralizing antibodies. Okay. So that's how uh, uh, VLPs are generally developed. There can be different, uh, different matrix, uh, matrices, uh, self-assembling matrices of bi uh, biomolecular origin. Uh, on top of it, uh, uh, you can display the antigens uh, in high density manner. So there can be different ways it can be done, but that was the major, uh, a, a generic uh, explanation of how it works. So now uh, there is a difference between what we generate in laboratory level and what we get in those vials uh, that is commercially available. So commercially available vaccines and what, uh, and 
all these are true for COVID-19 vaccine as well. So that's why I'm just going through all this. Uh, so what we have in, uh, what we make in lab and we use for uh, immunization purpose uh, is a bit different from what we get commercially. And how it's different is different uh, because uh, the commercial ones have stabilizers in it uh, for long-term storage. Um, uh, it also has uh, antibiotics and preservatives added so that the vaccine candidates, which is of biological origin, uh, doesn't uh, get spoiled or doesn't get uh, bacterial contamination later on because often these uh, materials are derived from uh, cellular uh, you know, bacterial uh, source or mammalian uh, cell lines or biological source in general. Otherwise, the antigens and the adjuvants are uh, same what we use in the laboratory versus uh, what we get commercially. Now, so... Um, we talk about uh, or we question whether a vaccine is efficient or not. So efficacy of a vaccine, how do we define efficacy of a vaccine? Now, vaccine efficacy can be defined in different ways. I have taken this from one of the recent papers. And uh, so it's a very beautiful representation how uh, we define a successful vaccine. So a successful vaccine doesn't mean it has to be uh, effective at a certain part, uh, a particular uh, level. So there are different levels. It can act, either it can uh, prevent infection by the virus, uh, direct infection from the virus. It can also prevent uh, from symptomatic to asymptomatic, uh, from asymptomatic person uh, uh, for the virus to spread to uh, the next person. Or it can also prevent a person uh, who probably gets infected, so, uh, but the, the person who gets vaccinated, uh, even after the infection, might not progress towards um, uh, you know, hospitalization or severity of the infection. So, uh, um, or the vaccine uh, might help in uh, preventing uh, mass spread in the population. So it can reduce the likelihood of uh, infection of an individual at individual level. It can prevent uh, severity of the disease or it can also limit uh, the degree of transmission. So either way, uh, so if a vaccine um, uh, is efficacious in one or two or more of uh, these uh, different uh, levels, it, it can be said uh, that the vaccine is efficacious okay it is not necessary that a particular vaccine will have all these properties now uh, i have just i whenever i give a talk uh, for um, vaccine development i generally show a um, couple of these slides um, because uh, i have faced this uh, question that how fast a vaccine can be developed so the timeline how can how fast can we be so it's very important to remember there are many steps uh, in vaccine development process and it's, uh, it's, it takes normally years. So it has been very uh, uh, surprising and very impressive now during this pandemic to see how fast we can be. Um, so the, the, uh, we uh, tried a lot and we have squeezed in a lot of steps and uh, tried to expedite it, but still it takes time. So why it takes time and what is what are the steps? Here it goes. So the very step, first step in vaccine development process is um, to, uh, to, to um, determine or to decide which type of vaccine you want to make. Say as a group or as a lab, if I have to choose uh, what kind of vaccine I have to make, I have to first decide it will be a subunit vaccine, it will be a VLP, it will be a attenuated vaccine, or it will be an inactivated vaccine. So once I decide that, so once I decide what my candidate would be like, I would make it uh, in at laboratory level at small scale or pilot scale. So once I have uh, a candidate vaccine, which can be protein, which can be RNA or DNA. Uh, now I have to see how stable or um, how stable that candidate is, or what is the integrity of the uh, molecule. So once that is accomplished, next is the animal studies. 
So you get approval here again. You need approval, institutional approval. After you get that, you do animal work, and uh, then you immunize your animal, and uh, you check, uh, you establish either establish a neutralization assay system or get it from elsewhere. But you also need a neutralization assay system in lab uh, to check. Uh, that after immunization of animals and after collection of uh, blood, uh, how much antibody or what is the title of antibody uh, that has been generated. So once uh, you see that your uh, candidate is able to generate uh, high titan neutralizing antibodies, and remember it has to be neutralizing antibodies and not essentially only antibodies. There can be different types of antibodies that have been produced and not all the entire full uh, might not be neutralizing type. So uh, we have to, it's not the ELISA, but it's uh, the neutralization assay that is important. So once we know that my candidate is uh, potent uh, enough for uh, eliciting high titan neutralizing antibodies, is then that I move towards approvals required for testing my candidate in humans. So then starts after getting uh, the approval from different, uh, you know, regulatory bodies. Uh, for example, FDA or there are different regulatory bodies in different countries, and uh, then you start the clinical trials. The clinical trial itself is, an, uh, is a different world altogether. There are three diff, uh, major uh, types of uh, clinical trials, uh, phases of a clinical trial, which comes uh, before a vaccine candidate is allowed to be released uh, uh, in the population uh, by the market. Uh, so, uh, so phase one, two, and three. Phase one and two is about safety and efficacy or immunogenicity. Uh, how much immunogenic, how much safe is a vaccine candidate in a human, on human perspective, and how efficient it is in eliciting uh, immune response. So uh, for the safety, um, safety, uh, safety is obviously checked in less number of people. So these different phases of clinical trials differ in numbers of volunteers recruited and the purpose. So from tens to hundreds to thousands is what typically the numbers are when you talk about phase one, two, and three trials. Often phase one and two are clubbed together depending upon uh, the, depending upon the urgency and the kind of outbreak. So like in case of COVID-19, we have seen a lot of uh, publications saying phase one slash two. What does that mean? Because phase one and two in their, case are, in their case are going side by side. So they are clubbed together. In phase three, once the efficacy and safety is asserted, um, the vaccine goes uh, for trial in uh, for masses. So there are thousands of people and uh, from different geographical locations. Okay, so this is large scale testing. And once uh, you get interim data uh, of uh, whether the vaccine is efficient uh, in uh, large scale, uh, in, in a large scale, then um, uh, the vaccine is um, picked for releasing in, uh, in the market. So now I have not put uh, the last phase, which becomes complicated for the general uh, people to understand. But even after a vaccine is released in the market, after uh, people start getting vaccinated, that vaccine candidate or that vaccine now is monitored for many years. And that's the phase four trial, which is after releasing uh, the vaccine in the market. Okay, so that elaborate a trial is in case of a, a vaccine a clinical trial, right? So since we are uh, racing, are we racing against the time? So I already explained it, but just an overview, I just found this very nice picture. It shows uh, what uh, the process is entirely. So the first uh, one is, uh, at laboratory level, I already told you, and uh, so there are two different uh, checkpoints here or authorization checkpoints. One is from when uh, when a vaccine is moving from lab to uh, clinical trials, then so from uh, animal to human, so the approval one comes here, and then. Uh, 
through phase four. So when after phase three, it releases in the market, uh, there is another approval. So these are the two major approvals. And here phase four is also, so it's post-marketing surveillance, you can say, as we also see in polio vaccine. Uh, so it's been monitored over many, many years. So as you move from phase one to phase three, you see that the uh, probability of if, uh, the efficiency or uh, the function of a vaccine or efficacy of a vaccine increases. So um, if a vaccine uh, had been only 40 to 50% uh, probably uh, uh, the success, success rate had been 40 to 50% at lab le uh, level and it successfully went to phase one clinical trial uh, and then phase two and phase three slowly the percentage increases. Okay, now, um, so in case of COVID-19 vaccine, uh, we have been uh, recently um, reading a lot about uh, many vaccines. Typically, there are four vaccines that have shown promise, which I'll be com uh, coming very soon. I'll explain those. So one is from, Ox one is Oxford vaccine, then the two mRNA vaccines, and we have Sputnik V that is from Russia. So out of these, uh, there are a few which are, um, uh, you know, RNA-based, mRNA-based, and uh, but they are very, eff uh, their efficiency is high, right? So Pfizer, Pfizer wants to sell uh, the mRNA, uh, uh, the uh, its mRNA vaccine or similar mRNA vaccine comes from NIAID or the Moderna, which is again. Uh, an mRNA vaccine and has uh, high promises and even India is thinking about importing that. But what is the problem in that? These uh, uh, nucleic acid based vaccines is a storage. So cold chain is a big hurdle. So uh, this is how it works. So when a vaccine is released in the market, uh, so say a vaccine is uh, produced or is been discovered and produced in a particular country, say United States, uh, it is sent to uh, other countries, so the destination country, from the destination country, there is a main place where it is sent and from there it is dispersed into different places within the country. So each place needs a cold storage and all uh, these cold storages uh, have to be uh, of uh, grade negative 70 and less, so negative 70 or negative 80. So that grade uh, of storage facility and that extensiveness uh, of availability of the storage facility uh, it is a bit difficult in uh, a country like ours. So that's where is another checkpoint. So we have to think about it. And then it becomes even more difficult from uh, when it moves from, uh, from cities to uh, rural areas, to villages. Uh, by the time it reaches from uh, its origin to the final destination, we also lose uh, a fraction of it uh, uh, due to the storage problem. So now, um, so let's see um, the COVID-19 virus. Um, so this virus uh, is a is a uh, enveloped virus. Okay, so um, it has a proteinaceous uh, uh, capsid inside, or we call it as nuclear capsid, but the outer structure looks like this. So we uh, we all know now this structure. We all know it. So these uh, crown-like structures on the surface are the uh, famous spike proteins. Mm, so uh, and we also have the envelope protein and membrane protein. So these are all uh, those proteins which make up the structure, the outer shell of the virus. Inside that outer shell. Uh, we have the nucleocapsid, which is nothing but the nucleocapsid protein, which holds on the uh, viral RNA inside. Okay, so uh, a virus has two different classes of proteins, structural and non-structural proteins, and so does the COVID-19 virus. The structural proteins form the structure of the virus, um, and the non-structural proteins play a role only uh, in the viral life cycle to proceed inside the host cell. So if a virus uh, enters the host cell, the outer shell disintegrates, the viral uh, genome is uh, 
uh, you know, um, uh, exposed inside the host cell. And then viral genome is translated. This is a positive stranded RNA virus. So uh, that means, um, I won't go into detail, but that means that uh, first uh, step is translation. As a result of translation, viral proteins are produced. So these are the structural and the non-structural proteins. The non-structural proteins help further in translation and replication of the virus. So new viral RNAs are produced, and now the structural proteins here, that is the spike envelope and the membrane will uh, go, nucleocapsid will go and bind, uh, nucleocapsid binds the RNA and all these other structural proteins will assemble. So here, self-assembly occurs. So assembles into progeny viruses, and these viruses are released. So essentially, all these proteins, the structural as well as the non-structural proteins uh, can be of um, uh, interest to vaccine engineers. Okay, but mostly in case of COVID-19, what we have seen is people have um, only tried um, the structural proteins, particularly even in a among the structural proteins, they, uh, most of the people have tried spike protein, and uh, some who have uh, gone for the whole virus, they, they had to take uh, the envelope as well as the membrane proteins. But we have not seen uh, efforts uh, with respect to the non-structural proteins, but non-structural proteins can also be used as uh, vaccine um, uh, targets. But then in this case, uh, this will uh, function essentially only uh, uh, inside the cell. So what, when I say that, um, that would mean that uh, if I use non-structural proteins as vaccine candidates, the proteins have to be delivered uh, inside uh, the host cell. It will be uh, processed and then um, so uh, by the proteasomes and, uh, and then presented on class one molecules. And then, uh, you know, uh, the steps that I described earlier, uh, those happen. Okay, so um, because of the fact that uh, the uh, spike protein is the uh, uh, is the protein that our immune system um, uh, looks at or is visible to our immune system uh, more often or more prominently when uh, the virus infects uh, uh, the body, spike protein has been uh, used by most of the groups as the vaccine uh, candidates either the entire uh, spike protein or parts thereof so the spike protein what is the function uh, th this is the main protein that binds to the ace2 receptor that is the receptor for this virus on the host cell so it binds to the ace2 receptor and mediates viral entry now uh, the spike protein is a uh, is a homotrimer so uh, it's a homotrimer. Um, so three uh, subunits uh, of spike protein uh, come together and they form spike trimer. And that's what you see as crown-like structure on the viral surface. So uh, this spike protein, which is, uh, so this, you can see here schematic representation. It's uh, here is a monomer. Each spike protein has two subunits, the S1 and the S2 and terminal S1. C terminal S2, and on uh, the spike monomer, uh, you will see a part called as the RBD or the receptor binding domain, if you have heard of it. This receptor binding domain mainly interacts with uh, the receptor and uh, so mediates direct, uh, direct uh, uh, interaction with the receptor to mediate the entry process. Now, uh, for uh, engineering vaccine uh, candidates, people have either used uh, the spike trimer. Why I have put this diagram is to tell you either uh, uh, the entire spike trimer has been used as a prefusion complex. So spike trimer or monomers or the receptor binding uh, uh, domain itself. So it's a domain. The domain by definition is an independent unit of a protein structurally and functionally independent units. So people have also gone for uh, using uh, the receptor binding domain separately, or they have used, um, again, uh, they have either used protein or mRNA. So uh, this I have already covered. 
So now if you see what is uh, the status, so I just picked up, uh, pulled out this uh, information today from um, WHO's website. So as of today, there are more than 160 um, candidates under preclinical trial and very impressively, over 48 of them have uh, are undergoing uh, clinical evaluation. They are either in phase one, two, and three, or one of these clinical uh, trial phases, early clinical trial phases, at least trial one, phase one. Within India also, we have uh, seen a lot of efforts. Uh, particularly, I have, I have pointed out particularly those companies which um, have moved forward, progressed forward a lot, like Bharat Biotech and Karila Healthcare. Both of them had got uh, in the month of July, end of July, if I remember correctly, approval for conducting phase one and two clinical trials. In case of Bharat Biotech, um, they have uh, used a whole virus inactivated vaccine and for Karila Healthcare, they're using a DNA plasmid vaccine. Oh, so both of them are under phase uh, one and two. Phase one is already over. Phase two also reports we have seen, um, interim reports uh, ha have been discussed about. Okay, so, uh, and then you also hear about Serum Institute. Uh, once in a while, they are developing their own live attenuated uh, vaccine. And then there are other companies. So uh, here is a list of the major ones which have uh, attracted the news uh, quite a bit more often. Uh, the Chadox one, that is the Oxford vaccine, uh, the two mRNA vaccines here from Moderna and Pfizer, and then the Sputnik V, uh, Sputnik V from Russia. So um, other, so all these uh, four, uh, that is from Russia, um, Chadox one, uh, is under phase three. Uh, Russia has already uh, uh, given the vaccine out, uh, although their phase three results are not published yet. Um, the two mRNA vaccines, uh, very recently in the last couple of days, we have heard about uh, their promising uh, results. And Pfizer and Moderna are about to, um, you know, uh, process their. Um, official papers with FDA for uh, approval and marketing. So uh, the first one is uh, the Oxford vaccine. We have been hearing about uh, since the pandemic started. So what is this? Uh, this is also called as uh, Chadox-1 or um, the chimpanzee adenovirus Oxford vaccine. That's how the naming has been done, chimpanzee adenovirus Oxford. So this uh, is based on adenovirus vector. So this group had earlier a modified chimpanzee-based adenovirus extensively genetically engineered to make it roughly replication deficient. And so uh, what they have done is to take spike protein expressing gene and put it into adenovirus, uh, this Chadox-1 viral vector. And now uh, this is supposed to um, in fact, uh, the, uh, when it's used as a vaccine candidate, it would enter the host cell and the spike uh, proteins will be produced uh, to uh, generate immune response. And uh, there, uh, so a couple of months back, there um, these two results were um, already published in By Lancet, and um, those were really promising. And they are been able to produce uh, T cells and the B cell responses and uh, protein neutralizing antibody response. Now, the mRNA uh, vaccines, there are two, as I said. Uh, one is these are the most uh, promising vaccine candidates, uh, and they are about to be released in the market. Whether we'll be use, uh, India will be able to use it uh, a lot or not, that we don't know because that depends upon the cold storage availability. So mRNA 1273 comes from uh, Moderna, which is a company. It's a, uh, so it's a collaboration between NIAID, National Institutes of Health, uh, and uh, Moderna. Uh, and uh, BNT 162B2 uh, comes from Pfizer and um, Biotech. So they, they made it. The, the basic difference between these two mRNA uh, vaccines lie um, in the fact that in case of Moderna's vaccine, 
they have used the prefusion spike trimer so that you remember that spike is in the form of a trimer uh, so they have they stabilize that primer and using that uh, uh, using uh, they devised an mrna they designed an mrna that would express stable uh, spike primer and they put uh, the mrna in a lipid nanoparticle as a vaccine candidate in the case of pfizer's vaccine uh, instead of using the entire spike protein they used uh, the receptor binding domain again uh, they have put their mrna uh, in a lipid nanoparticle itself so how does this work so this is the lipid nanoparticle uh, say and um, so here this is a virus but uh, so uh, here in circles uh, the magnifying glass type of a structure shows uh, the spike protein uh, so from from the sequence of the spike protein you can engineer the rna um, mrna and mrna uh, one thing is it's very cheap to generate so the production time and cost is less as compared to the other vaccines but the cold storage uh, becomes expensive later on uh, and the stability is a problem but uh, mrna so this mrna is encapsulated inside the lipid uh, nanoparticle and this is bottled and then used uh, as the vaccine this lipid uh, uh, nanoparticle uh, can readily fuse on uh, host cells mm -hmm. and will release uh, the viral uh, mrna inside uh, the mrna inside and the mrna we all know from mrna protein uh, is translated you, uh, so the spike or the parts of the spike protein the rbd will get synthesized inside and uh, the uh, you know immune response is generated so that's how it works so uh, that's uh, now i will end my presentation by essentially saying that uh, currently we have four vaccine candidates um, that are promising that have undergone uh, undergone extensive clinical trial phases they are either in their uh, uh, phase 3 ongoing or phase 3 interim has been interim report has been uh, uh, already published uh, so uh, those are uh, oxford vaccine um, the two mrna vaccines sputnik 5 from russia although there are issues in that but these are essentially the four uh, although we have vaccine candidates in hand uh, which we uh, we hope that they come out in the market soon and everyone gets it um, so um, we have strategic problems that's again the cold storage and the cost related issues so each country has its own problem um, and we have to deal with it and strategize uh, make policies um, and if our uh, if our economy doesn't fit in then we have to design our own uh, candidates and at least we have we do have our own candidates and uh, we need to uh, keep our patients and work more on those as well side by side because uh, as per plan um, and as per recent uh, uh, information, um, the plan is to provide the vaccine first to the frontline uh, workers like the doctors, the police, the, uh, the caregivers to the patients, and those who are directly exposed to the virus. So those are the persons who will be getting the vaccine first. Then it will be uh, the elderly people, the children, and last, the other people. So it is always better we have uh, other uh, candidates, cheaper candidates in hand and uh, vaccines in hand so that uh, the population, uh, the entire population, uh, all the people who gets uh, access to different uh, vaccines in due time. So with that, I would end and I will thank um, CSIR and IICB for research support. Um, INYAS has been instrumental in my career and I would, uh, especially thank Indian National Young Academy of Science for providing me uh, so much of support and has been a great platform for me to establish myself as a, a young scientist. And uh, SERB, DST, and uh, DBT for uh, financial support. Uh, Royal Society of Biology, I'm a member of uh, RSB, so uh, I definitely acknowledge uh, RSB. And uh, I'm also a member of the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World. And I really thank uh, this organization for all the support has been given. And with that, thank you so much.
Yes. That was a very encouraging uh, talk, ma'am. Uh, I would like to ask uh, if anyone has a question to ask. Upasana, I would um, I would like to uh, discuss a couple of things like, you know, um, as you rightly said in your uh, presentation that uh, vaccine development really take a lot of time. But, you know, we are learning a lot out of this uh, pandemic and then a lot of things have been a lot of new things like the way we are conducting seminars and webinars. And a lot of things have been, you know, converted into um, uh, less time consuming. So now onwards, my question is that basically now onwards, vaccines for other diseases also will take lesser time uh, as it is in the case of Corona vaccine. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So ideally, uh, if so, if you just ask me as a biologist, um, I would say if I can do that we, or we can do that for COVID, we should be able to do that for other uh, diseases as well. Uh, of course, we uh, must not um, uh, run too fast because if we run too fast, we fall. So we, with all the precautions taken, yes, we can expedite, but you know, um, how much to expedite that also is determined by how urgent is a particular uh, uh, condition is, you know, how much, so how much risk to take versus how much urgency is. So if something is very urgent, we do, we are ready to take a bit of risk, but uh, if it's not that urgent, then we can always wait a bit more. So that's the strategy. Correct. And other thing is this, that India having a huge country as well as, you know, um, huge diversity uh, in terms of uh, living standards, income and other things. It will be a huge task, a mammoth task to you know, immunize uh, everyone and which government is really planning. So how much time do you think it, so it will take? Uh, because yes. that's again a very good question. Yes. And yes, so um, uh, these companies, commercial companies are very wise, at least some of them. So that's where policy matters. So a lot of these companies uh, like Pfizer and Moderna, what they have done, or even that case AstraZeneca, what they have done is, um, they have, so they made uh, pretty good investments, taking risk that the investment might go into drain, but then what they did is while they had started their phase one clinical trial, they had started manufacturing their uh, uh, vaccines as well. So uh, they, so, so they took that, this measure to make sure that if uh, their vaccine uh, turns out to be okay, uh, and released, uh, gets approval for releasing in the market that they don't have to wait extra for manufacturing this vaccine. So they have already started manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you um, for a wonderful uh, talk and a uh, lot of insights. We could learn that how COVID uh, virus, you know, effect of body, how does it go, how does it replicate and many other good things now my it is over to you if anyone else has question they can ask any other members who want to ask any questions well we will upload we, will, we have recorded this lecture and we will upload it on inya's youtube channel also and then uh, there also, if somebody asks question, we can send it to uh, Dr. Pasna and she can answer it later on as well. So I think we have to, because no other questions from the yeah. audience side. Mayuk? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, then I would like to give the uh, vote of thanks. Uh, respected speaker, Dr. Rupasana Rai, our senior, respected senior faculty members, my colleagues, respected participants from INEAS, invited guests. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion, especially on the subject, which has not only taken millions of lives, 
which has also created a global pandemic. I, on the behalf of MNNIT Allahabad, and on my own behalf, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to Dr. Rupasana Ray for such valuable insights about the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine and about where did we start and where we are now. That means uh, we, the, the discussion was really uh, uh, insightful about how a vaccine works and what a successful vaccine is expected to do or the timeline that a vaccine development that takes and everything. And obviously it, we came to know that vaccine development takes time. But obviously we also have a very good news that even though it takes time, we have several candidates that is on the rise. We currently have 48 vaccines under clinical evaluation trial phases. And it's a, it's a matter of pride that our beloved motherland India is also not very behind in development of this vaccine. So I would also like to sincere thanks to Ineos, uh, extend a sincere thanks to Ineos for their uh, enormous cooperation in the organization of this event. I wish, but obviously, as long as the vaccine does not come out, we have to stay uh, cautious. And I wish such cautiousness in every individual will be the key step to free this world from such a pandemic and thereby providing us with a happy world. Once again, I thank you all for giving your precious time and staying in this webinar and your valued participation. I hereby would also like to inform you that uh, that, uh, that like the previous uh, webinar, we also have a very successful webinar in this week as well. So uh, thank you all. I'll mark the end of this vote of thanks with a heartly wish for a pandemic free life for all of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all. Thank you all.